what about, we're talking about BRAF MEC, but what about the new kids on the block? I mean, Encoraftin and Binimetinib are relatively recently developed drugs. Jason, what can you tell us about Enco and Bini? I mean, different mode of action, different drugs, different side effect profile? Yeah, so Encoraftinib and Binimetinib are the third BRAF MEC combination to, be, to gain regulatory approval. And I think it's uh, interesting to observe that uh, the development of these drugs was informed by the development of the previous generations of BRAF and MEC inhibitors. Uh, and specifically what I mean by that is um, it was, it's clear from the previous studies that adding the MEC inhibitor actually decreased the BRAF inhibitor toxicity. And we don't have time to drive into all that, but we know that from, from other studies. Um, and so in the study of encorafenib and binimetinib in the phase one, they actually pushed the dose of the encorafenib up a little higher than the one-for-one -one dose that you would see with the currently available BRAF inhibitors. And so that's very interesting because we have this hypothesis that if you really suppress BRAF and downstream signaling, you could get a better benefit. And so the randomized phase three data of encorafenib and binimetinib compared with a monotherapy BRAF inhibitor showed a clear improvement as had been the case for the previous combinations. What was interesting, however, was that if you looked on an absolute level, the progression-free survival for encorafenib and binimetinib looked higher than what had historically been reported for other combos. So whereas around 11 months had been the median progression-free survival for dibrafenib trametinib and vimurafenib cobimetinib, for encorafenib and uh, binimetinib, it was about 14 and a half months. So that looked, now it's not compared head to head and it's a different era of melanoma therapy, so we don't know for sure, but there's now an update for the long-term overall survival from the same study showing similar things, which is the overall survival looks extended based on the previous phase three trials. Now you have to, it's, this is cross trial comparison kinds of things, but at a minimum it says that these are active drugs. And when you look at the toxicity profile, it actually looks rather favorable compared to the other drugs in class. And so I think this is definitely a combination that should be considered when you're looking at available options options for patients. So Ryan, we will hear about update on Columbus, which was the randomized three-arm trial that led to the registration of ENCO and encorafenib and binimetinib. So what can you tell us about that presentation, meaning what do we know about the updated survival? So it appears that the essentially what's, what's happened with the updated survival is the median, which was I think at the last time they had a data cut was about three years and now it's about four years. So they have an initial year of follow-up. Uh, the median hasn't changed, not surprisingly, because the, the follow-up was, was greater than the median. Um, uh, but it does indeed show that the median overall survival of oncorafenib plus binimetinib is about 33 or 33 and a half months, something in that ballpark. Uh, with single-agent oncorafenib, uh, it's about 23 months. Uh, and with single-agent vemorafenib, uh, it's uh, 16 months. So that's overall survival. So. Uh, interesting, that's about the overall survival for vemorafenib in the early trials with vemorafenib. So um, it, it does seem that, that single age oncorafenib, I haven't seen the, the curves yet, so I don't know if there's a statistical difference between the two BRAF uh, inhibitor single agent uh, arms, uh, but, but certainly the combination is, is definitely better than vemorafenib. It and, looks, and, it, and, and compared to what we've seen with other combinations where, whose median survivals were about 25 months, it mm -hmm. seems like it might be a little bit better. But rumor has it, sort of the, the other urban legend is that it's less toxic. So Hussein, what can you tell us about uh, how you manage the BRAF MEC toxicity? And do you think that any of these regimens really differs in the overall toxicity profile? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, kind of to think about what encorafenib could be different in than other uh, BRAF inhibitors, I would, I would highlight the fact that there seems to be a slower dissociation constant, so it seems to actually stick to its target and hold on to it a little longer, which could be part of the reasons it works better. But really interestingly, binimetinib, which is kind of one of the issues that we have in the toxicity of targeted therapy is that MEK inhibitors have significant toxicities um, in terms of ocular toxicities and uh, even pneumonitis incidents and, and um, you know, even cardiac toxicities. And binimetinib actually seems to be the shortest half-life of all MEK inhibitors. Other MEK inhibitors have half-lives that means that you can wait two to three weeks to actually get you know, complete, a complete washout from the MEK inhibitor where this is in the terms of hours, so you can actually get a washout from the MEK inhibitor within a couple of days. So that actually may be some of the reason that we see a better safety profile for this combination, and that kind of helps in the management of the toxicity as we manage those patients, because when we observe the toxicities, namely they're kind of in the, in the uh, range of fever, fatigue, um, some ocular toxicities, 
the first thing we usually do for those patients is to actually hold all drugs. And typically, especially if it's a fever situation, you hold all drugs and within a day or two, the fever dissipates and you may be able to restart at the full doses without having to dose reduce. Um, if we face some recurrences of these toxicities, then we start thinking about dose reductions. And I think, again, uh, with dabrafenib and trametinib, you can you know, dose reduce if it's a fever, we dose reduce the dabrafenib first. With Inco and Bini, that actually gives us the opportunity that you mentioned that the 450 milligram dose is the currently approved dose, but there was in the phase three trial a, com a combination of incorafenib at 300 with binimetanib that looked also better than vemurafenib. So you can easily go down to the 300 milligram without being too fearful about losing efficacy. And after we go past a couple of dose reductions, if we continue to have toxicities, and now we're talking three, four months into therapy, so you know if your patients are responding and how well they're responding, so we take that into account as well. Uh, occasionally, and I have to say it's a rare event, we can add a low dose uh, steroid, such as prednisone five milligrams, to help us maintain those patients on targeted therapy. So we talked about BRAF MEG toxicities, but Vern, I think Dirk Schadendorf is gonna present some data on quality of life, which we're finally hearing about from the 067 trial, which is a very mature trial with four or five years of follow-up, but that was the IPI versus NEVO versus ZIPI nevo 945 patient three-arm study. So what can you tell us about quality of life? So you're exactly right. We've got all these choices. How about asking the patient, well, what do you prefer? What's better for you? What about my quality of life? Patients really do focus on that, sometimes more than the physicians who's focusing on median overall survival, comparing three trials from three different generations. Ask the patient what's important to them, and then try to find out what happened. And the answer is a really mixed bag of, of answers. Number one, our quality of life instruments are, are blunt. They are not precise at really telling us exactly what's going on. I think the message from this particular trial was pretty clear, that if you, once you get through the initial side effects, especially of the Ipinevo combination, which has a lot of them, if you get into a maintenance phase, most of those patients maintain a very reasonable quality of life that's not dramatically different than what it was before. But every once in a while, a patient has a rare but very lingering complication. And then they say, well, if I'd known I was going to get that, I wish I'd gotten the other drugs. But we don't know that. And that remains a major, major limitation. And so now we have a spread of options. We have three different BREF MEK inhibitor combinations that have three different sets of toxicities, all similar but some unique. We've got PD-1s that have relatively low toxicity and the combination of PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4 that really ramps up the early toxicity. We need to be asking our patients what's most important, how are you going to weigh and balance the advantages and disadvantages of these regimens. 